Good evening and welcome to the inaugural meeting of the Brisbane Dialogues for what we hope will be the first of many challenging, entertaining and fruitful exchanges. On behalf of the organisers and also our venue host, the University of Queensland, I wish to acknowledge the traditional owners of the various lands that make up the regions, the region we know today as Greater Brisbane. We acknowledge their ancestors and their descendants who continue cultural and spiritual connections to country. As we gather this evening in one of University of Queensland's most beautiful venues, it's worth reflecting on the fact that this, like many of the university's other spaces, has been the site of learning, problem solving, collaboration and dialogue, not merely since 1911, which is when teaching commenced up the road on the, uh, uh, in Old Government House in George Street, but for tens of thousands of years. In that regard, we are simply continuing the tradition tonight. We're all here because we're concerned, at one level or another, about polarisation, about toxic discourse and the implications for social cohesion and our democracy. For some, I'm sure it's philosophical or ideological. For others, it's about society and community. And for many, it's more personal. It's a deep worry about family, work and relationships. It may even be a matter of mental health. For me, it's a combination of all of the above. A frustration with ego-driven, gridlocked politics, a distress about the challenges for my own profession of journalism at a time when straightforward news reporting no longer seems to make money, and concerns for my own teenage children who are constantly drawn down digital rabbit holes and into filter bubbles where the various algorithms ensure that they hear and see only what keeps them engaged online for the longest, regardless of truth or decency. It's probably what they're doing right now when I'm here. <laughs> Recognising those various problems, of course, is much easier than, than devising a solution or even just making a dent. It was a difficult personal conversation that prompted retired businessman Murray Hancock to try to do something about restoring civil discourse locally. After he sounded out his family and friends, he discovered a near universal recognition of the problem and a willingness to try to find some solutions or support an initiative. So the Brisbane Dialogues was formed with a steadily growing band of committed volunteers supported by an increasing number of generous partner organisations such as the University of Queensland. What you see tonight is a result of combined effort and goodwill in a very short period of time. I think it's a pretty good start. From the outset, the founding group has been committed to establishing the Brisbane Dialogues as a wholly independent, non-partisan, intergenerational pro bono project to foster civilised public discourse about big ideas and issues. It will not belong to one group or be beholden to one set of ideas. It will be the sum of all of our inputs and all of our efforts and I'll speak more about what that means practically at the end of the night. Although there are many good organisations with a culture of practising respectful engagement, we believe the Brisbane Dialogues is the first dedicated civil, civil discourse organisation in Australia. And of that, we are particularly proud. We hope to tap into Queensland's reputation as the home of plain speaking, pragmatic, but good hearted individuals who are naturally sceptical of the latest intellectual fads and fancies that tend to capture our southern counterparts. It's not really respectful dialogue, is it? <laughs> it's just between us. Uh, <laughs> the Brisbane Dialogues aims to offer an alternative to business, the business of, as usual, of events and lectures that preach only to the converted. There are plenty of organisations that offer lectures for a particular audience. We'd like to bring people of differing views together and ask that they demonstrate the power of their positions, not through acerbic put downs or shouted insults, but through compelling, thoughtful exchange. Our only request of them and of our audiences will be they, that they abide by what we have dubbed the Brisbane rule. And the, the rule is this. All participants agree to listen carefully, speak civilly, and concentrate on the content of discussions, not on personalities, before, during and afterwards, online as well as offline. Sounds so simple. 
But no one says it'll be easy, but I think the potential is huge and exciting. Fortunately, as I've mentioned, there are fine organisations around Australia and individuals who've long recognised the importance of this sort of civil discourse and engagement. One of the best known on the national stage is former Deputy Prime Minister and Nationals leader, John Anderson. As a journalist who's travelled with him during a fast-paced and unpredictable election campaign, I can personally attest to the fact that Ando, as we knew him at the time, was an, can, was an utterly warm and decent human being who proved that you can be all of that and still get your point across and be an effective leader. Many of you will probably know that since retiring, John has committed himself to encouraging open and honest conversations through his own conversation series, which is um, on YouTube and also available as a podcast. Unfortunately, he couldn't join us here tonight, but he's been enormously supportive of the Brisbane Dialogues and what it represents, and he recorded uh, us this message. I'm very sorry I just can't be with you this evening for the inaugural get-together of the Brisbane Dialogues. It's an important initiative and I hope it grows into something that can't be ignored. I've come to believe that given the plethora of very difficult issues that confront us as a nation, as a culture, as a people, our greatest problem is that we can no longer debate any of them reasonably and rationally and calmly without emotion, without hatred, you can't get good public policy out of a bad or a truncated or a silenced debate. You won't get the best ideas on the table. You won't get people dealing in good faith. You won't get people out owning the outcomes. And that's reflected in the incredibly fractured nature of Western society today, which is mirrored in our politics. We have to do better. That's what you're about tonight. No matter how heated the debate, if you can keep it rational and keep it focused on the issues and respect one another enough not to personalise it, we can really find our way forward much more effectively as a country. I think we owe that to our children and our grandchildren. I hope you have a great night. So now it's time to get on with that demonstration of what civilised discourse can actually look like. Uh, but first, we won't silence the discourse, but we will silence the mobile phones. So can you all check that they are on silent? If you'd like to uh, t live tweet, uh, for those of you who are understanding what that means, um, we did a quick uh, check and we'd like to nominate the hashtag Briz Dialogues, or one word, uh, for anyone who's wanting to be engaged online like that tonight. And I do remind you of the rule, the Brisbane rule that says respectful um, uh, interaction only online. Uh, in the event of an emergency also, could you please all uh, follow the instructions of the Customs House staff. And now, I'm honoured and grateful to welcome two very distinguished guests as our inaugural participa participants in the Brisbane Dialogues. First, Please welcome to the stage Professor John Quiggan, Australia's most cited economist. John is a professor of economics at the University of Queensland, a former director of the Queensland Competition Authority and the Australian Climate Council, and has published books on topics including climate change, microeconomic reform, privatisation, employment policy, and the management of the Murray-Darling River system. His latest book, Economics in Two Lessons, Why Markets Work So Well and Why They, fa they Can Fail So Badly, was released in 2019 by Princeton University Press. John is a social democrat who believes, as we will hear, that postmodernist philosophies arose historically on the political right and have now been reinvigorated by that side to dispute the need for climate change in the post-truth world. Now, could you please welcome Professor Stephen Hicks. <laughs> professor Hicks is a Canadian-American philosopher who is a professor of philosophy at Rockford University, Illinois, 
where he is also Executive Director of the Centre for Ethics and Entrepreneurship. He is the author of Nietzsche and the Nazis and Explaining Postmodernism, Skepticism and Socialism from Rousseau to Foucault, as well as the co-editor of The Art of Reasoning, Readings for Logical Analysis. Stephen is a libertarian who believes the Enlightenment ideas and values which have underpinned extraordinary human progress are being undermined by dangerous postmodern ideas which threaten our future, mainly from the left. And finally, to facilitate this exchange and ensure the Brisbane rule is, is upheld, please welcome Rachel Nolan. Rachel is the Executive Chair of the McKell Institute, Queensland, an independent progressive public policy think tank. She's also a former State Minister, Minister for Finance, Transport, Natural Resources and the Arts. She holds an honorary academic position in philosophy at the University of Queensland and has been published widely on, on Australian politics and economic policy in leading current affairs journal, journals. And now, Rachel, over to you. Thanks, Christine. In Stephen Hicks's book, Explaining Postmodernism, he quotes Stanley Fish, the American postmodernist, who says, deconstruction relieves me of the obligation to be right and demands only that I be interesting. As your facilitator, I'll try and be both. <laughs> As an audience, I have just one request of you. And that is that at this moment, you just take note in your own minds of where you think you stand in this debate. I will ask you later to reflect on where you'd land and if indeed your minds have been changed. The debate is Soho Forum style, which means that each speaker has 15 minutes to present. We will then have some facilitated discussion in which the two speakers may politely interrupt one another. And we will then ask for questions from you, the audience. I have a very powerful bell, <laughs> which I'll ring at 14 minutes to give our speakers an indication that they're nearing the end of their time. The topic is that postmodernism is a right-wing philosophy. Speaking in the affirmative, it's my pleasure to introduce UQ's Professor John Quiggin. Well, thank you, Rachel, and thanks for uh, uh, Brisbane Dialogues for inviting me here. I'd also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we meet. And, um, as I say, looking forward to this event, which arose, I guess, because uh, Stephen is visiting and we needed some hometown uh, <laughs> alternative. So, uh, uh, although I'm not a professional philosopher by any means, this is a topic that's interested me for a long time and I was very happy to uh, take part. So, uh, oh, have we got the clicker? Oh, no. <laughs> Sorry, we'll just... Thank you. Um, so... Obviously, the post-truth era has already been mentioned, and I think if you want to pick one moment that symbolised the emergence of the post-truth era, it was shortly after the inauguration of President Trump in the United States in 2017. Uh, the crowd, while of course large, was disappointing, not as large as on some previous occasions, and, but President Trump felt it ought to have been as large and um, sent his press secretary, Sean Spicer, out to claim that in fact it was. Now, there was nothing, I think, really surprising about that. Uh, press secretaries have been getting up telling porkies in front of the journalists uh, for, for a great many years. Uh, so the, this wasn't the event. Uh, it wasn't particularly exciting. What happened shortly afterwards was that uh, President Trump's personal counsellor, Kellyanne Conway, went on a show called Meet the Press. And uh, the moderator of that show, Chuck Todd, asked her, well, why would you make claims about something that's both so trivial and unimportant and also where the facts are so obvious? And um, gaining immortality, Kellyanne Conway said, well, uh, you've got facts there, but uh, we had alternative facts. And uh, that produced uh, a vast number of memes, some of them impolite, but I just, uh, uh, this was a, uh, I looked for the best one I could find, just, uh, just give us the alternative facts. And so 
Uh, if you're a detective now, you don't need to worry about what the actual outcome was. Just, just pick the one you want and find the facts to support it. For those of us who've been following postmodernism, this pluralisation is, is a, a striking thing. If postmodernists don't talk about knowledge, they talk about knowledges, don't talk about truth, they talk about truths and so forth. All of these things are in some sense, uh, in some sense uh, are relative. And I should say from the outset, as I've already done the disclaimer, uh, there's lots of deep, subtle things to postmodernist literature uh, coming out of uh, Paris. Uh, I'm mainly going to be dealing with the relatively vulgarised version that, uh, that makes it across the Atlantic and uh, uh, to the US and then thence to Australia. So, uh, so very much one in which uh, relativism about truth is, is a, crucial, a crucial phenomenon. So this was interesting in a couple of ways. Uh, first, a striking fact is that Sean Spicer, although he told a few fibs, was basically a traditional style as press secretary. He didn't last more than about three months. Kellyanne Conway is still there. So that says, I think, that we're in a new world. Uh, the second point was a lot of people talking about this and seeing the reference to knowledge said, well, really, Kellyanne Conway almost certainly wasn't reading Foucault or Derrida or any of these French people. Uh, just, this is just, in some sense, a coincidence. It turns out that that isn't really as definitely true as you might think. Uh, this, uh, if you follow US politics at all, uh, you might be aware of something called the Federalist Society. It's basically the training ground for conservative lawyers and judges. Uh, uh, all of the recent Supreme Court judges appointed by, by Republican presidents have gone through the, through the Federalist Society and has a magazine, um, as a magazine, The Federalist. And uh, this was the uh, lead article in that journal on the, um, I think the 20th, the date there is the 23rd of January. One odd thing about the US is uh, the date that appears in an article isn't actually the date it comes out or a magazine. Uh, they always post date it by week to keep it fresh. So you can always, if you go into a US, uh, you know, New US news agency in March, you can buy the April issue of any magazine you like. So the implication is this article would have come out a few days before Kellyanne Conway made her statement. It was an article about her boss praising him as the first uh, successful right-wing postmodernist. If she was doing her job carefully, she would have read the article. Certainly, I think she would have run across people who were, uh, who were aware of this kind of strain of thought, that these terrible postmodernists have warped the truth, but now it's our turn. Uh, we're going to do the same thing. And that's pretty much the tenor of the, the, tenor of the article. I'll argue a bit later that um, that things have been going on a lot longer. A lot of people want to blame Donald Trump for, for everything, but this is actually a much uh, a development that's taken quite a while longer. I'll briefly go back. I think Stephen will cover this. If I've read his books, and he covers very well the right-wing origins of postmodernism in German philosophers, starting with Nietzsche, and his book Nietzsche and the Nazis has already been mentioned. It, that's a complicated relationship. Going on to people like uh, Heidegger, Carl Schmitt, who are actual Nazis, actual members of the Nazi party, who took part in persecuting, um, persecuting fellow scholars, uh, de Man, who was a, a collaborator with the Nazis in Belgium. Uh, these people, uh, this, the origins of this philosophy, there's no doubt, were found on, on the far right. Uh, why is that? Well, essentially because this was part of a long series of reactions against the Enlightenment, uh, a movement uh, starting in the late uh, 18th century, central of the French Revolution, in which reason and rationality and facts were seen as the path forward. And on the contrary, starting indeed with Edmund Burke, a leading conservative in Britain, uh, people use words like organic, which can rapidly translate to blood and soil and then to actual blood in the hands of, of people like the Nazis. Uh, that far from there being some universal truth that uh, could be attained by reason, uh, people like Burke start arguing, you know, there are specifically English truths, that uh, England has its own traditions and that what's right for England uh, is not going to be, what's right for France is not going to be right for England and so forth. So, uh, so all of that stuff seemed after 1945 to be pretty much dead and buried. Uh, Certainly, you didn't hear much about it in the English-speaking world. Uh, but then we have the puzzle. How did this uh, very right-wing set of ideas, opposed to the progressive ideas of liberalism and socialism that had emerged from the Enlightenment, how did this uh, suddenly become uh, fashionable on the left? Because there's no doubt that it was. Well, the answer first in France is that um, the French intellectual scene was heavily bound up with Marxism. Uh, 
The French Communist Party was one of the biggest and most successful in the world, and, uh, and all of the intellectual framework was surrounded by Marxism. When Marxism collapsed in the 1970s and 1980s, uh, people, had in, people in the French intellectual scene had to look elsewhere, and what they came up with was postmodernism, a suspicion of all what they called grand narratives. Uh, they just didn't want to hear any big stories. They roughly wanted to say, look, one story is as good as another. Let's just, uh, uh, let's just uh, have fun playing word games of various kinds. Uh, but uh, that, that played an important role in that French scene. When it transmitted to the English-speaking world, to the US and Australia, uh, the ones I'm most familiar with here, a very different situation. There was no significant influence of Marxism. Uh, what there was had died pretty much uh, uh, in the past. Uh, the Australian Communist Party, for example, actually dissolved itself in 1990, having got down to 1,000 members. So, so there really wasn't anything like the Paris scene where, where your opinions on Marxism really mattered. And so the impact of this was really confined almost entirely to humanities departments, and particularly to literary departments, plus a handful of uh, philosophy departments. The vast majority of philosophy departments in Australia are what's called analytical, uh, but there are a small number who followed the Paris fashions and they had that influence. That enabled them to take radical sounding stances without really having to engage with, uh, engage with the big issues of, of the uh, collapse of the post-war boom and, and the swing to the right that was occurring around the early 1990s when it seemed as if market liberalism was triumphant. Uh, people might remember a, a book called The End of History, uh, based, basically saying, look, it's all over. Uh, essentially, free markets are won and nothing is ever going to happen to change that uh, in the future. Again, greatly oversimplified. So um, uh, there was always some academic politics involved. Humanities departments have been under a lot of pressure. Uh, everybody wants STEM, science, and science has the path to truth. Postmodernism, let the critics say in very fancy, complicated words, no, look, it's all equally good. Our stories are just as good as your stories. Uh, there's nothing special about science. Uh, that produced a reaction on the left in the form of the famous Sokol hoax, which uh, Australians love hoaxes. We had the Ern Malley hoax and, uh, and many others. And this guy Sokol, a left-wing physicist, uh, submitted a bogus article with a marvellous title, Transgressing the Boundaries Towards a Transformative Hermeneutics of Quantum Gravity, which was uh, full essentially of nonsense, was accepted by a prominent postmodernist journal and caused great mirth and hilarity. And that really, uh, that event in 1996 really signalled that was the high watermark of postmodernism on the left. Uh, from then on, in large sections of the left, it was seen as, as uh, damaging and dangerous. Uh, but meanwhile, it was being picked up on the right. Uh, creationists were the first to come in with, because of course they had an alternative science, they had a bit beef to pick with science. They realised that if you could buy this story, their creation story was just as good as the scientist's creation story. And indeed, I had some fist, verbal fisticuffs, not, I have to admit, entirely in the spirit of the Brisbane Dialogues, with a, <laughs> a, a guy called Stephen Fuller, who appeared as a witness for the, um, uh, for the, for the creation science group in a famous trial, the David trial, even though he had previously been seen mostly as a person on the left. Uh, that was the first shift of that kind, uh, but the big news, I think, came as, I, as was advertised with climate change. Here we had a huge issue in which the scientific community was uh, almost entirely uniform. For a little while in the 80s and 90s, coal interests could dig up more or less qualified scientists to cast doubt on, on the findings. There was still plenty of room for, room for debate, but by 2000 or so, the opinion was so overwhelming that you had to go elsewhere. And indeed, we, we started to see uh, the classic kind of postmodern tropes emerging in the climate science debate to suggest that uh, really there's no such thing as truth, so it doesn't really matter what scientists think. Furthermore, they're just an interest group like, uh, like everybody else, and, and, uh, and so we really shouldn't pay any attention. You know, the general phrase is, I'm just an engineer or something, but you know, I think this, and my opinion, is just as good as any hoity-toity scientist. Uh, so that kind of thing has been developing uh, for a long while. I haven't got time to give chapter and verse on it, but I think uh, we've all seen it. Uh, we've all seen it, uh, many examples of this uh, uh, in Australian politics of people with no qualifications whatsoever and who haven't really done any work uh, setting their opinions up as, as being as good as, as those of scientists. And so in terms, that has a striking impact uh, in the context of the... Uh, of the 
way of the political alignment of the, uh, of the academy. That uh, when this stuff started, it was fair to say that, uh, uh, that we found uh, most of the lefties in the arts and humanities faculty, the business, uh, uh, business and economics, where we work was more to the right, of course, and the scientists largely paid little attention to politics. If you look at surveys now of American and Australian scientists, they're the most uniformly left-wing, hostile to uh, at least anti-right-wing anti group uh, of any part of the academy. So something like 6% of, of Republicans, sorry, 6% of scientists describe themselves as Republicans, and that's true. And that's essentially because uh, people understand who their enemies are. So, uh, so that's the, that development has gone on and on, and, and I think the problem is the style of argument it puts is, uh, is uh, damaging more and pernicious more generally. Essentially, uh, what postmodernism works for is the group who's losing the argument. That's why, why it appealed to uh, the Blood and Iron guys back in the 30, 20s and 30s, why it appealed to uh, uh, humanities academics under pressure at the time of the end of history, and particularly to French Marxists, why it appeals to the political right now that issues like climate change have made it clear that the apparent triumph of free markets is much more problematic than it was. Now, to that extent, it's just symmetrical. It's obvious in some sense. There's a, a saying I uh, read from a lawyer saying, well, uh, if the law's on your side, pound the law. If the facts are on your side, pound the jury with the facts. If you don't have the law or the facts, pound the table. And, um, <laughs> uh, and so that's, in some sense, if, you're, if you don't have the facts on your side, an argument like this is always, is always um, appealing, and sometimes, at different times, the facts have been more favourable to the left or to the right. The reason I want to argue that uh, it's inherently a right-wing rather than a left-wing philosophy is that... Oh! Oh, that's a very... I was a trying very dingly not dingle. to do that. Uh, so, uh, is in this world of multiple truths, back in the... Uh, Back in when this stuff emerged, the humanities academics who pushed this stuff naively imagined that it would be the truths of indigenous people and the oppressed and those sort of people who would be validated by this story. My view is, well, supposing we treat all truths as valid, which truths are going to prevail? Those that have, I say, a major news or empire behind them and the power of the rich and powerful, or those of the poor and weak? And I would say, uh, I would say it's going to be those of the rich and powerful, and the only chance the poor and weak have is if we all stick to the facts, argue sensibly and rationally in the spirit of these dialogues, uh, and don't uh, succumb to this uh, lure of thinking that truth is relative. Thank you. Well, John, you're a master of timing. Yes, oh, yes, that's my timing going. <laughs> and now I call on Professor Stephen Hicks, uh, all the way from Illinois, to deliver the negative argument. Please. I'm going to start by talking about baboons, the uh, small ape. They're apparently terrible hunters. There's a pack of baboons, and they are hungry. They see something off there, and the leader effectively says in baboon, let's go get that thing and eat it. And so a whole bunch of baboons will take off, and they'll go running after whatever it is. And then, of course, whatever the prey animal is, it darts into hiding, and the baboons are running along, and they start to forget what they're doing. Right? And they're running, why are we running? And then they look over, and they see this other baboon, and they say, hey, you're that guy that stole that piece of fruit from me this morning. I hate you. Attack the guy, and the baboons then start infighting, and the hunt is a complete failure. And this is apparently a common pattern. So short-term memory, strategic sense, any understanding of principle, keeping the eye on the long-term game, not possible. But very quick to anger, and very quick to respond to and remember almost forever personal slights among other baboons. Now, chimpanzees are apparently smarter and quite better hunters, and they can develop strategies, including sending out advance parties, pincher movements, right, divide and conquer strategies, and so on. And they are then much more successful as uh, hunters cooperatively and socially. 
But they too have their limits. And what seems to happen is that chimpanzees can only be comfortable if they are hanging out with other chimpanzees they recognize and whom they're able to keep track of on a fairly regular basis. And they start to get uncomfortable beyond numbers 50 or so because then they can't keep track of everybody. And so what they typically then do is, since they don't have any conceptual ability to think of a large scale society and principles that are going to enable peace and con uh, conflict resolution and so forth, they split off into other groups of 50. And then from then on, the other tribes are typically seen as, as enemies. And so they'll monitor each other very carefully, but then as soon as there's a member of another chimp tribe is ooh, enemy and hostile reactions. So a very limited ability to conceptualize. So baboons and chimps, short-term emotionalism, inability to think long range, conceptualize large social organization, and a hostility toward personal slights and anybody who seems not to be a member of my own tribe. And for some reason, that reminds me of Facebook discussions and other social media, and I am sure you know what I'm talking about in that regard. So we in the modern world do face a problem because unlike chimps and baboons, and, uh, we want to think of large-term societies, millions of people, and what's going to enable all of them to pursue their own interests, to form cooperative institutions, and when they have disagreements, find ways to keep short-term emotions and slights in check, keep the eye on the bigger principle, and to recognize that there are larger scale principles, that if we recognize those and follow those and pass them on to the next generation, we can keep our civilization going. And that seems to be the problem we are facing right now with the toxic discourse and the polarization. But I do want to put this in some perspective, and I'm clicking. We in the modern world <clears throat> have first world problems, and that includes the formerly called third world, the entire world, and so on. This is a quick timeline of human development from year one, 500, 1,000, 1,500, up to now. This is total wealth production uh, around the world, and we're measuring it in now tens of trillions of dollars. And we have a basically flat line for all of human history, and then what happens right in around the 1700s is unbelievable. Skyrocketing productivity and the creation of all of the wealth that we are then able to enjoy. So that is the era of the Enlightenment and the modern world is built on the ideas and the values that were articulated in the 1600s and institutionalized in the 1700s. And we, in a relatively short period of historical time, are living in the benefits of that. Now that's GNP, that's only one measure, gross national product. If you're interested in life expectancy, boom. Right? around the same time. The number of people who are living in extreme poverty goes down, so this is the people lifted out of extreme poverty. The calories available to people on a regular basis. The number of people who are living in democratic and republican types of institutions that uh, I and I know John Quiggan to, to a large extent agree with, also skyrocketing in the same era and it's all connected, enlightenment philosophy. And essentially, in my view, this was a liberal philosophy. In all of the major areas of culture, we revolutionized our way of doing everything. We, of course, are aware of the democratic and republican revolutions politically. Right? Everybody is going to participate. Anybody can put any crazy idea out there they want, and we'll have a good fashion discussion about it, and we will vote on the basis of that. We liberated the entrepreneurs. Uh, anybody can go into business, and you can start any business that you want. You can trade with anybody that you want. You're not stuck in a class and so forth. We started to liberate the slaves. We started to liberate women. We started to uh, uh, free and respect people's right to do religion, their own particular way, uh, and so forth. So in all of the major cultural institutions, including science and technology, we talk a lot about the Industrial Revolution and the science scientific revolution. Anybody can come up with any crazy scientific idea, and a lot of the best ideas, of course, as we know, started off from people whom everybody else thought was pretty crazy and out there. Free thinking in science, free thinking in engineering, in politics, in business, in religion, 
It is a liberal revolution and it's all connected. That is the enlightenment. We have figured out a mechanism it's not just the content of the ideas in business and in engineering, and we're acquiring all sorts of knowledge that we can then put to the benefit of human beings, but it was a methodological principle about toleration for creative and free thinking. Anybody can think any idea they want and put it out there, and we will debate it and let the best arguments win, and we will decide it by the basis of argument. And this requires character development because it's hard to have your ideas criticized, but we teach people how to have your ideas criticized and how to engage in fruitful criticism and so forth. So the liberal ethos right, included character training as well as development of all kinds of knowledge, and the fruits are with us. And that is the modern world, that is the Enlightenment, and that is precisely what the postmoderns are attacking. But contrary to John Quiggin, I'm going to argue it is 99.9% .9 a phenomenon of a segment of the left. The left is a big tent, but there is a very toxic segment of the far left out of which postmodernism came. And let me make the case for that next. Richard Rorty, right, you go through the names of who the top postmodernists are, you go to Wikipedia or wherever you want to start, you will hear Richard Rorty, you will hear Michel Foucault, you will hear uh, Jean-Francois Lyotard, you will hear Jacques Derrida, and a whole bunch of others. So I'm going to give you some sampling. So here's Richard Rorty. Postmodern task is to figure out what to do, quote, now that both the age of the faith, that is essentially the Middle Ages, uh, religious philosophy dominating, and the Enlightenment, seem to be beyond recovery. So the whole scientific, technological, industrial, market, democratic process, beyond recovery. Whatever we've been doing in the West for the last 2,000 years, a total failure. That's where we are. Longtime philosophy professor at Princeton University, since Professor Quiggin was nice enough to mention my book, I'll mention that his recent book, also published by Princeton University Press, where Rorty was teaching. So the Enlightenment, hopeless. That's an American. This is an international movement. Here's a Brit. Right. We live today, it's not just that it's beyond recovery, amid the dim ruins of the Enlightenment project. So if we are honest and we look around the world, the society that we are living in is what the Enlightenment gave us, and it's, it's horrible. It's a ruin. It's a wreck. It's awful. There's a Frenchman, Jean-Francois Lyotard. He is the guy who gave us the label postmodern, saying we are now in the postmodern world and described the postmodern condition. Based on the perception of the existence of a modern era that dates from the Enlightenment, et cetera, et cetera, it has run its course. And it made all these promises about progress and we're going to solve all of these problems and so forth, but it's carrying on without leading to any of those dreams. All of the dreams of the Enlightenment have not materialized. So what we have, American postmodernists, British postmodernists, French postmodernists, the Enlightenment, the modern world has been a failure. We live in the horrible ruins of it, and that's why we need to go postmodern, beyond it, whatever that is. <clears throat> Michel Foucault, of course, the one who's most cited and so on. There is no such thing as knowledge, there is no such thing as truth, there is no right, there is no justice. Even if you are one of these people who believes that there is such a thing as right and truth and justice and fairness, that instinct of yours is malicious. You're a bad person for believing that. I won't read this one. <laughs> Men and women, equal rights, ultimately coming together for mutually beneficial win-win transactions. That's been the promise. We're going to extend liberty and equality to all, including women. As the modern world delivered on that product, obviously a jaded portion of postmodern feminism says absolutely not. It is conflict, it is oppression, it is dominance. That is the postmodern condition with respect to males and females. Stanley Fish mentioned a little bit earlier. The modern world says, hey, be tolerant, listen to arguments. Put yours out there, expect to be able to take the heat, dish the heat, and so forth. And a well-educated mind is going to know the best arguments on both sides. And if you are a teacher, a professor, it is your moral responsibility to make sure that your students are exposed to both arguments from you and that there's an atmosphere of tolerance in the classroom for them to explore those and make up their own minds. When that argument was presented to him, by a professor he was co-teaching with, Fish's response was this. He said, that's ridiculous. That's not what you want to do as a professor. 
It is a battle, it is a war. You want to squelch, silence your opponent's arguments. Don't even bring them up. One of Fish's colleagues, Franklin Trickia, at Duke University, postmodernism, yeah, seeks not to find the foundation and conditions of truth. Yeah, no, we're not interested in truth. That's not what we are doing anymore. Instead, we are about power. I am a professor, I have power, and I am going to use my power for the purpose of social change, which is code for saying I am changing people into activists who are going to go out there. It's not about truth and exploration and students making up their own minds. I have power, I use it to advance my agenda. And your task is to help students spot, confront, and work against the political horrors of one's time. And you'll notice the assumption is that we live in politically horrible times. Not just that we have our usual disagreements and so forth, but rather we live in a dramatically dysfunctional political climate. And my job as a professor is to teach students the horrors of our current society. So of course they will get angry, and what they will do as upon graduating is go out and do what angry people do. Now, from what perspective are we looking at current society and saying, hey, this is pretty horrible, and I'm angry about it, and we need to blow it up and move on? Well, Jacques Derrida, deconstruction, the literary method right, that he has primarily fulfilled, so never had any interest or meaning, to, at least in my eyes, except as a radicalization, that is to say, also within the tradition of a certain Marxism, in a certain spirit of Marxism. So absolutely, the postmoderns are going to be post-Marxists. Marxism, old, clunky, doesn't work, has been a disaster, but the spirit of Marxism must live on, and we on the far left who were raised as Marxists and are true believers in Marxism, we need to find a new strategy. So exactly right, failing movement, but it was a failing Marxist left that was the failing movement. And it's not just Derrida, it's Michel Foucault, member of the French Communist Party in the 1950s. He left after a while. But in the 1960s, with the rise of Mao in communist China, he declares himself a Maoist, right? This is the new right, revolution. Disappointed in the 1970s, he declares support for the theocrats in Iran, right? So this is a man who has not a single liberal instinct in his body. Consistently over the course of the decades, he is on the far left. Richard Rorty, as far left as you can get on the American political spectrum. Jean-Francois Lyotard, whom I mentioned a little bit earlier, was a Trotskyite, right? a spin-off group from, uh, from original Marxism, Lesninism. So all of the major postmodernists far left. And it's not just the big names. You look at the top 100, the top 200 in the first two generations, there's not a right-winger, however you define right-wing, among them. They are all monolithically far, far left. So as a historical fact, postmodernism is a left-wing movement. It's a re-strategization based on a reading of the failure of enlightenment and modernism. Now, right-wing postmodernism. We're now two generations, perhaps three generations, into uh, uh, the resurgence of postmodernism, and we are seeing the effects. Young people who have been taught by the first generation big name postmodernism, but they were big names. They produced hundreds and thousands of PhDs who then went on to become professors, who then went on to become, train the next generation of professors and so forth, who trained lawyers and journalists and all of the other professionals who would be taught various post -mings. And They were not monolithically successful in all areas, but they have significantly been entrenched in intellectual and cultural life. Now the right is starting to counteract. I and mean, notice Professor Quagan started to keep things very contemporary about what's going on among some right-wing movements, and I'm happy to say more about Trump in the question period, but I do want to say right now, the answer to this is no. If you look at what's going on among right-wingers, however you define conservatism, right, and so forth, they are not adopting post-truth strategies. There are some who are engaging in conflict models, who are engaging in irrationalist political strategies, who do believe uh, 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 in non-rational uh, epistemologies and so forth. But what you find is they are saying what we need to do is not 
go forward, but to go back. We need to go back to the good old days. We need to re return to the pre-modern time when there was in perhaps more religious form, uh, a common unifying faith that we all had. Or if in more nationalistic and ethnic forms, back when our people, and sometimes our people is defined ethnically, sometimes a little more racially, but our people was a great people. And that is then to go back to the good old days. So what we really have, if we're gonna start parsing out, is yes, much of the right is starting to go back to a more pre-modern approach. The far, far left is still stuck in a very toxic form of postmodernism, and then at least a third position has to be the modern Enlightenment people and those who I hope <laughs> Uh, those of us in the room mostly are a part of who want to say, no, in fact, the modern world and the Enlightenment still has a lot to value. Let's stay the course. Thank you both very much. John wins on time, but that's not the game. <laughs> <laughs> I owe you a minute. <laughs> <laughs> we'll see what we can do. So one of you begins your discussion of postmodernism with Kellyanne Conway, yep. and the other begins with baboons. Mm. And my challenge is to walk a path through this. As I see it, um, John's argument is that <clears throat> there are the seeds of postmodernism, even as far back as Burke. Yes. Um, that the movement was then very much adopted by the left, and indeed the hard left, um, through much of the 20th century. Um, I'd say only from the 1990s onwards. So. All right. Um, but that they gave up the game after 1996. Um, Is that fair? Well, I mean, obviously, 1996, I'd say, was the high watermark. Mm -hmm. Obviously, that didn't. You know, there was plenty of back and forth after that, but... If you look at the people that Stephen mentioned, they've nearly all been dead some considerable time. Um, and there aren't really any new names that you can conjure with. Uh, and I think you know, that reflects the fact that these ideas have, uh, have never really made it out of the, uh, out of the literature department ghetto in the, uh, in the English and English speaking context, and that they're very much in retreat, even in France, uh, uh, so, so we're really talking about, I, I certainly use the word is advisedly. I think there definitely was a period, which Stephen points to, when, uh, when postmodernism was a movement of the academic left. Uh, but uh, I, I, don't, I, don't, I think the statement is correct. And I think the points that were made about nationalism, the, for, the origin of this was incredibly nationalist movements. It was, it was the Nazis. It was Heidegger and Schmidt. Uh, it was, in more benign form, Edmund Burke, saying about national particularity as opposed to universal rights. So, so although some parts of the right are purely pre-modern, the uh, fundamentalist, yeah, Christian fundamentalists, for example, a large segment are very much going back to a kind of nationalism which has been opposed to Enlightenment ever since it emerged uh, and which is entirely has been, has been nurtured by various forms of, of what we now call postmodernism throughout its history. So this, I think, is a tremendous point to draw out because when I listened to the two of you, um, I could see, and it's probably not my job so early in the debate <laughs> to find synthesis, but I could see a line through this that argues um, postmodernist origins in Burke, adopted in a big way by the left, and as you argued, then moves to the right in the contemporary period. Um, Stephen, you no doubt will disagree with some of that, and I will, um, will, th will throw to you to do so, but how do you respond particularly to John's point? So you argued essentially that um, Trump doesn't reflect postmodern, uh, that, that his anti-truthism isn't necessarily postmodern, that the yeah. contemporary right are arguing for something different, for a nationalist, uh, position that looks back. John said um, there, were all, there was always nationalism in the origins of postmodernism. So my question is, um, how do you respond to that? How can that not be true? And why is nationalism um, necessarily different from 
postmodernism? Why can why can one not be contained within the other? All right, that's a fair question. So uh, I think if you're going to have a serious breakdown of the political taxonomies, what you have to say is yes, absolutely. There has been a long strain of nationalism, and if you trace nationalism, it doesn't start with Burke. It starts uh, generations earlier, and Burke is a kind of right figure, uh, and you can trace that on through Hegel right into the next generation, and uh, Fichte in a bridge generation, and then uh, all sorts of right German thinkers. Uh, we don't want to get too, too uh, pedantic here, right, and so forth. But what you find is that those people are uh, uh, anti. Enlightenment, right? but at the same time, there is a left strain that starts with Rousseau, the generation before Burke again, and then is picked up by Marx, and Marx was a student of Hegel, and uh, is, is, uh, typically the, uh, the Marxists are seen as left Hegelians, uh, and then carries on uh, into all of the left movements that we're familiar with and so on. Now, this is then to say, okay, well, we have left and right, but we're using European designations about what counts as a distinction between the left and right. But notice what they both have in common. They both, on the left and the right, say that there is a collective group that takes primacy over the individual. And that the collective group is the nation for the far rightist, and the collective group is going to be some economic grouping if it's a Marxist. All of them, both left and right, are anti-rationalist or anti-reason in their epistemology. So in addition to being anti-individualistic, they are anti-reason in the favor of adopting and absorbing one's group's tradition in a more Burkean tradition. Right? Or, uh, it's say, in a Marxist tradition, that say what we call reason really is just conditioning by your economic circumstances and nobody is really able to think for themselves and so forth. So what you then have is a left and a right, but they share very fundamental anti-individualism and anti-rationalism. So the best initial start mm -hmm. on a better political taxonomy is to say we have modern enlightenment philosophy, which is pro-reason and pro-individualism and pro-freedom. And then you have two strains of collectivism, two strains of irrationalism, and both of which have authoritarian, violence-oriented uh, methods politically. And those ones happen to split then into a left form and a right form. Now, which is why I think left and right are almost useless for any sort of serious political uh, discussions. I understand they have journalistic currency and so forth, but that is how I would, as a first draft, respond to the, the question. I'll have to come back later on Trump. No, 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 unless we you want to give me more time, because I know I'm running long. I'm so. going to let John respond. Absolutely. We're not getting out of this a discussion yeah. Yeah. that I'm facilitating yeah. and getting yeah. out of Trump. Yeah. Okay, that's right. <laughs> Feel you're trying to smuggle individualism into the package. I mean, if we take yeah, the ultimate enlightenment figure, I would say, is John Stuart Mill, who ends up as a socialist. Now, certainly a kind of abstract, high-flown kind of socialism, but if you ask the question, why is it that the word liberal in the US context means social democrat, mm. it's because uh, within the Enlightenment tradition, there's a long tension between uh, concern for individuals, concern for individual freedom, and recognition that we are, like chimpanzees and baboons, I guess, social creatures. Uh, we can't just uh, let the devil take the hindmost. We have to look after everybody. So that debate has been going on within the Enlightenment tradition uh, for, for a very long time. And in the context, particularly of the English-speaking world that we're talking about, uh, the vast majority of the left comes out of that liberal tradition, uh, starting with John Stuart Mill. Marxism has almost had no purchase. It, it, it was a European movement which briefly had significant power, maybe in the middle of the 20th century in Australia, but uh, has never been significant in Australia or the US outside some very brief. It's certainly an argument you can safely make here. Yeah. You uh, might not in Paris, but you said. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, sure. a big, big, yeah, it's certainly a big deal in Europe, but, but it really in the English speaking world, we, we, are, we are seeing uh, both postmodernism of the right and left breaking away from the Enlightenment tradition, but much more completely. There's no equivalent of Trump on the left. Bernie Sanders, although you know, it's, it's just an ordinary old social democrat who likes to call himself a socialist, there's no equivalent to the kind of movement away from Enlightenment values that we are seeing across the, uh, uh, in a place like Hungary, Poland, uh, all sorts of places now, uh, yeah, that, that breaks with that tradition. So let's go to Trump. <laughs> 
All right. Uh, in terms of practical politics, I don't follow day to day. My mm. Trump filter, my Sanders filter are pretty high. I see the words on my screen mm. and I just zoom, zoom past it. <laughs> Here you are. That's, that's, a, that's your strategy okay, for Sanders. It's, uh, it's actually a strategy for getting work done, right? <laughs> Uh, but I, I do uh, do follow enough, and my sense is, uh, you know, I understand where you're coming from in saying that Trump is the first postmodern president, and part of, uh, you know, since he is a, a a new kind of phenomenon in some respects, that people are casting about for labels, and certainly early in his label or in his presidency, postmodernism was uh, was at a high watermark again in the culture, so people are trying out that idea. So I, I understand at a journalistic level, there's something there. But look, my reading of Trump is that he's not a postmodern person at all. I think that is too, uh, that would be too much of a compliment in the, <laughs> no, in the following sense that postmodernism is a serious intellectual movement with principles that are thoughtful and that are integrated and that are strategic. And I don't see any of that in my understanding of Donald Trump. He says all sorts of things, but excuse my language, he's what we call a bullshitter. Right? He just says stuff, puts it out there, right? And he doesn't take it too seriously 80% of the time. He doesn't expect you to take it too seriously 80% of the time. He's also a certain kind of New York businessman, right, where you are constantly, right, engaged in pushing people, probing their buttons, making outlandish claims, right, and so forth, and you're trying to stake out some territory at the negotiating table, and he's just carrying over that kind of brash, businessman style to national politics. Uh, if we want to say whether post, uh, Trump is on the left or the right, you know, I think that's a really hard question. He was a Democrat for most of his career. He only uh, later went to the right, and I think that was because he thought he had a better chance of uh, having some inroads. But if you think about you know, what are some standard left positions for the right, right in America, uh, certainly a significant number of free traders among them, and that has been a dominant position in the Republican Party up until Trump. The position about tariffs and protectionism and the president picking favorite businesses uh, to, uh, to, to shower subsidies on and so forth, that was something that Democratic presidents would do and they were drawing a large part of their base from the unions. And so what you find now then is Trump is courting the union uh, vote rather successfully. He is enacting tariffs. He's an anti-free trade guy. He's a fully a... Uh, a, a president, big government guy, picks uh, picks the favorites, put tariffs up and so forth. And that's just to say, by that criterion, he is moving to the left. So, John, this is the last bit of facilitated sure. debate before the audience get a go. Do you, are you willing to accept this argument, or is this no, too I, convenient for you? I would come back on the literally not seriously stuff. There was a, fam the, the famous article which said tr Trump's opponents take him literally, uh, his, his supporters take him not literally, but seriously. And that just struck me as both true, as you just said, he's a bullshit artist, but also as incredibly postmodernist. When I read Derrida, he's always saying this stuff and you think you've pinned him down and he's said there's no such thing as truth, and there's a ha-ha. Yeah, I mean, at a much higher intellectual level, of course, but this kind of irony that you also see in a much more toxic form on the, on the alt-right just strikes me as absolutely redolent of, of the kind of word games that, uh, uh, that, that characterise postmodernism. So you would argue, um, I imagine you'd accept Stephen's point that it's not entirely deliberate. He hasn't spent his, no. his days reading he's, he's a sort of political he's, philosophy and, up to yeah. now. And he's a product of, he's a product of this, this whole development on, you know, which I, you know, in which climate change is, has really played a crucial role of, of people just saying, look, as long as it scores a point for the team, it doesn't really matter whether it's right or wrong. All right, we will call on our audience to see. Now, I'm going to ask for questions rather than statements. Yes. <laughs> so short preambles only. Um, we have two roving mics, one at the back, the other I can't see, two at the back, and I need hands in the air. Who's willing to get into this? Let's go, Amanda, to a man about three rows from the back in what appears to be a grey shirt. <laughs> yes, um, just a question to both of you. Do you think Donald Trump would be able to understand this discourse tonight? <laughs> <laughs> I don't, I'm, I'm unclear, but it, it's, clear that people, it's clear that people in the intellectual milieu that gives rise to Donald Trump 
you know, the, National, the Federalist Society, the National Review and places like this, uh, do understand it. And also, you know, although of course, uh, you know, have, brought, have almost without exception, there's a tiny, tiny group of never Trumpers there who, who carry on with very traditional enlightenment sort of views, have more or less just gone on with the fact, well, look, it doesn't really matter very much whether, you know, whether we have free trade or not. You know, we've, our guy's in and his truth is our truth. I have no way of knowing whether you would participate, right, or not flip a coin. <laughs> Some things are genuinely unknowable, perhaps. Mm, yes. We have a question with a man down here in a white shirt. Sorry to... Um, mm. And can I ask uh, those of you who are interested in, making, in asking a question, as this one is asked, keep your hand up, because I'll identify the next speaker so as to uh, minimise our pauses. So please. Coming to the purposes of our meeting tonight, could I ask both John and Stephen to talk about deplatforming and uh, where you think that has come from and uh, what its origins are? I think, Stephen, you probably alluded to it, but I'd be interested to hear what you both think. Yeah. Can I go first? Please, yes. Okay. Uh, the deplatforming phenomenon is uh, you know, a frontal assault on liberal education, right, through and through and through. Uh, and the ethos that anybody can speak their mind and uh, that we will be tolerant, and tolerant does mean having a thick skin and expecting that there are going to be lots of things that are offensive to you and that you uh, uh, disagree with quite strongly, but that people have the, the, the right to say those things in the appropriate platform and so on. So the, uh, the systematic uh, attempts to disinvite Right, people who have been invited to make certain that certain people do not get invited, if they manage to get on stage to shout them down, to threaten them with physical violence, or people showing up with weapons at university campuses uh, uh, and so forth. Uh, and relevant to the, the postmodernism uh, phenomenon, there are not young conservatives running around deplatforming people on university campuses, young libertarians or young centrist organizations. It is coming from the far left and all of the splinter groups there, uniformly. That's where the cancer is. So, I mean, deplatforming is stupid. I mean, the, the theory of it is these people have plenty of other platforms. It's really done to obscure people. It's done to famous people who can talk, and the claim, the claim behind it is, well, they can have their say in Fox News or, or in the New York Times, they don't get it here. I think it's a very silly, silly theory. On the other hand, I'd make two points. The first is, it's not exclusive of the left. If you remember the uh, election campaign, you remember rallies for Trump in which people were beaten up for holding up signs opposed to Trump and Trump himself saying, I will pay your legal bills uh, if you should be prosecuted for this. So it's the impulse to shut people up is, is pretty... Um, uh, is pretty widely spread across the uh, uh, across the political spectrum. Uh, I think the um, the other point, I guess, is I, you know, I find America more, you know, and this is true, a lot of this discussion, incredibly obsessed with what happens on university campuses. I mean, I mean, I suppose I tend to think university students do stupid things. I've been one. <laughs> I've taught them. Uh, if we're really going to get our knickers in a twist about what university students are doing, we're going to be in a permanent state of anxiety. <laughs> Not too many of us here uh, remain university students. <laughs> no, I can see I've got the right demographic. <laughs> I think, I think we're okay. So. <laughs> All right, so I was trying to point to a lady near the speaker at the back. Oh, well, I wasn't trying to point to you, but I have a different lady, and then I'll go to a speaker at the back. But please, sorry to be rude to you. <laughs> no, no, really. <laughs> let's, let's have this lady who's now stood up in front of hundreds of people. <laughs> Thank you. My name is Leili. Thank you very much for the wonderful speeches. Um, what about in a, uh, instead of categorizing Donald Trump as postmodern or pre-modern, because I think that calling him pre-modern also is a kind of compliment. <laughs> How about, what do you think of him being kind of post-human? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, mm. I, I think we should probably get off Trump, because my, <laughs> yeah. my claim is certainly that, my claim is that this isn't, I mean, Trump is, is occupies, a phenomenon, occupies, yes. is yeah. a phenomenon but yes. is a reflection of much broader social trends. That's right, that's right. 
All right. So let's. Does anyone have a non Trump question? Trump question? <laughs> you are the winner. <laughs> the lady near the speaker towards the back. Uh, hello. My question was for Stephen. I was wondering if he could uh, speak a little bit about John Stuart Mill being a socialist, uh, what he thinks about that at, towards the end, which is what John Quiggin spoke about. And if you could also so, um, just explain a little bit. Um, I don't understand a lot about the libertarian perspective, and I just, if you could explain that a little bit. Okay, uh, the first half of your question, could you repeat that? Something about yeah. socialism. Stephen's or... struggling with our accents. Sorry. John Stuart Mill was a socialist. Sorry? John Stuart Mill was a socialist. Ah, yes, okay. Yeah, that's an interesting point, because Mill comes at the tail end of the classical liberal tradition. And I do see him as a, a transition figure in his own personal journey. So when he was young, he was very much individualist, market-friendly, uh, 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 women's liberation, religious toleration, the whole shebang. And so much of his great work on, on, uh, on liberty, uh, published in 1859, reads like a, a classical liberal, almost libertarian manifesto. But he is a, a man who's a very deep thinker, and if you are a first-rate philosopher, you consider well over 100 issues fairly systematically. And, uh, and in that mixture, the vast majority was liberal libertarian initially, but there were some elements of his philosophy that were more collectivistic. Uh, and as he developed, some of those uh, became more prominent. And I would not say that he became a socialist. I would say that he became, on a few issues, a supporter of a kind of a welfare state. Right? So, and you can certainly see the development of uh, a principle going in the welfare state direction is leading to a kind of socialism. So a split decision on John Stuart Mill. Now, what it means to be a libertarian, happy to talk about that. But I, that's, that's a second question, so I have to defer to my... No, I'm going to let you talk about that, because okay. this is a... To be, I think it's fair to say that this is a tradition that is um, far more alive and kicking in the United States than okay. it is here, although people are obviously interested. So yeah. I reckon give it to us. Okay. So let's say uh, uh, the, the way we do religion is perfectly libertarian. There is no state-enforced view. There is no expectation that uh, you have to be religious. You can practice religion any form that you want, go to any church, synagogue, right, or not, and so forth. You are totally free on religious matters. How we do our sex lives has been a great victory for libertarian thinking. Uh, whether you have sex, with whom you have sex, how frequently, whether you get married, whether you don't, whether you have children or not, that is totally a free choice of consenting individuals. Uh, what movies you enjoy, what music you listen to, how you dress yourself, entirely up to you. There is no state enforced, and there's not even a collective ethos that we try to enforce upon everyone. Do your own thing as long as you are respecting other people's right to do the same thing. So what the libertarians do is say, how we do religion, how we do our love lives, how we do movies, we should do that in all walks of life, including the economy. You can go into any business that you want, as long as it's peaceful, make whatever you want. If you can find someone to buy what you want or what you're making, uh, that's fine, but you have to convince the person. And we don't have any state-favored businesses and state-set prices and so on. You work it out for yourself. So it's a generalization on the principle of individual freedom, coextensive with respecting other people's individual freedom. Thank you for a terrific description. And the, uh, the other side of having the opportunity to share it is the opportunity to rebut it. Well, I, I was just observed. Stephen had a great graph there of how good things have got in the last two or 300 years. And as he points out, pretty much about the time of John Stuart Mill in the middle of the 19th century, uh, we abandoned you know, society as well as individual thinkers, moved away from classical liberalism towards a welfare state, a much bigger role for the state. So of, you know, of that 300 odd years, 150 years or so has been taken place under what might broadly be called social democracy. Um, that's what has the track record. Libertarianism in the sense that Stephen has put it is what Ayn Rand calls an unknown ideal. It, it's something which people have advocated, but which really hasn't, hasn't got a track record to say how great it is, because the progress we've had has been under a mixed economy, a mixture of the two. Thanks, John. I have a questioner right down in the front row, who is very eager. <laughs> <laughs> 
Hello, I have a question for both of you, and it's about uh, the fact that you've been talking a lot, obviously, about postmodernism, and thankfully you haven't mentioned fake news, but basically we were in that realm. And what I've been thinking is that fake news are really a big issue that you are discussing, which is, okay, your fact is not good, my fact is better, etc. And what I think is that they are nothing new. They've always existed. Herodotus or Julius Caesar uh, or Napoleon wrote fake news for propaganda to convince people. And I don't find this either left-wing or right-wing, neither postmodernist nor modernist nor pre-modern, simply an abuse of power when you want to win a contest. What do you think of this? Mm -hmm. Question for Stephen, question for both. John. Question for both. Okay. No, I think your that question is perceptive uh, because the what we call fake news is an ancient phenomenon, and uh, what we currently call postmodernism, with its uh, disregard for fact uh, or even a belief that there is such a thing as objectivity, uh, and replacing that with the idea I just have a personal set of values that I happen to be committed to, and I'm just going to advance them uh, uh, in, in an all's fair in love and war kind of way. That has been applied to journalism, to politics, to business, uh, in, uh, religion, and all sectors of society, and so on. So I think the best way to, to say this is that postmodernism, in one sense, is not anything new, that we always have had at least a three-way debate between a more, kind of, uh, if we want, we're interested in truth, but we find truth in a higher dimension right, as one approach. And then another said, we're interested in truth, but we find it in the natural world through rational and scientific investigation. And a third position that's skeptical, relativistic, and subjectivistic, and so on. They always exist in all cultures, right, at all time. What happens uh, is that uh, the philosophers and other intellectuals who are most successful in one generation uh, are, are then able to come to the ascendancy, and cultures decline or, 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 or make progress, I think, depending on which one is in, in ascendancy. So. Uh, in that sense, uh, postmodernism is an old threat. It's a, it's a new label for an old threat. Just, just to make the point, I guess, this it's a very intractable problem because even somebody as convinced as I am as objective truth is out there can't always find it. The fallibilism, I think, is, is, is clearly the case. We, we might, we, as sci in science and everything, seek for the truth, but we never get there finally. We make mistakes, and there's no... Uh, no once-off demonstration. I think the attempts at fact-checking that we've seen have shown that it's very difficult to really nail down even something like the number of people in a crowd uh, photographed by hundreds of people with uh, metres. It's very hard to nail this stuff down. But in the end, I think um, in the end, I think reality catches up with you. And I think that's again that's why I talk so much about climate change. I think coronavirus is the same kind of thing. You can pretend something isn't happening, but uh, the real world will come and get you in the end. I'm going to pick up on, we have questioners, but I, am, I, I meant earlier to ask Stephen about climate change and the, the broad denial of it which has existed to a greater extent on the political right. Mm -hmm. Is that not an example of, and John made the point earlier, but is, is that not a clear example of a postmodernist phenomenon on the right? Yeah. Well, I'm not a member of the right, so in one sense, I'm not a postmodernist. John's not a postmodernist, no. so in some sense, we're being perhaps uh, unfair. Yeah. But my my reading, right, of the people who are, and I don't think denial is a terrible word. And uh, when that word was first coined, it was explicitly meant to evoke Holocaust denial. And uh, so I think, in the interests of the Brisbane Dialogues. What's better is to say that people who are not on board with the belief that climate change uh, is happening or that it's happening seriously or the degree of human agency and whether we should make trade-offs and whether we should favor market solutions or political solutions, there's a whole raft of positions that are there. And the better labels, I think, are going to be, and I do know a number of people who are libertarians, who are, uh, who are conservatives, and who are socialists, who have scientific credentials uh, and who have looked at the data and they are not convinced. So what, what we would say is those people are climate skeptics. 
That's a legitimate label for that group of people. The vast majority of people who are well-meaning, thoughtful, keeping up on current events, when they go out of their way to look at both sides of the various arguments, they typically say, well, good arguments here and some supporting data here, good arguments here on the other side, some, some supporting data here. This is extraordinarily complex. I don't know. And that's climate agnosticism. And I think that is a legitimate label. And then there's a large number of other people who will say, look, I've looked at the data, and I'm pretty scientific literate, scientifically literate, and my judgment call is that it looks like, yeah, there is some warming that's going to happen, and the, the conservative estimates seem to be maybe two degrees over a century. I'm just making numbers up right now because this is not my area of expertise, right? and the numbers are changing on a fairly regular basis. And then what they will say is, oh, okay, I'm, I'm convinced that that probably is going to happen. Is that a disaster? Is that... 2% human-made, is it 8%, is it 20% human-made? That part we don't yet know. Uh, and is it, uh, even if it's going to be a problem, is it a problem that brings countervailing benefits? You know, I'm, you know, the, the joke, of course, in Canada is, we certainly will welcome some global warming. If you really believe in global warming, buy Canadian real estate, right? You'll, uh, in the next generation, <laughs> you're, become you're a millionaire, now. right? And so forth. <laughs> yes, yeah, so then you in Queensland might say, oh, global warming, right, and so on. So the point is going to be there will be trade-offs, and there are lots of people who will then uh, not buy into the apocalyptic understanding of climate change, but then say, okay, there's problems there, but there are trade-offs, and I'm willing to make those trade-offs. So I think the landscape on climate change is much more complicated and much more nuanced. John's burning up. Yeah, so that really comes down, it feels right to me. I mean, I could, I could cross out climate change and put in astrology and say, well, you know, there's astronomers out there and they all say that there's no possible way in which the stars can influence our, our lives and that in any case the constellations aren't real. But on the other hand, I've looked at the data and, you know, I read my horoscope the other week and it came true and... Um, <laughs> um, you know, the, if, if you take the Enlightenment seriously, you take the views of people who spent a lifetime studying the issue using the scientific method more seriously than your own casual reading of the newspaper, uh, especially when your own casual reading happens to coincide with your personal political preferences. And, uh, and so, uh, so I, I, really think, I really think you are expounding a very postmodern view of climate science in what you've just said. Can I respond? Of course you can. Okay. I don't want to get all credentially here, but my PhD is in epistemology, theory of knowledge, logic, and philosophy of science. I've studied a huge amount of the history of science. When someone says the science is settled, be worried. Be very worried. That is almost a sign of a certain kind of leveraging. And, right, I know enough to know what well-designed studies look like, uh, what counts as a, a nuanced conclusion on a position. And any time we look at uh, environmental chapters in textbooks, if you don't see, here's the arguments for one side, but here are the skepticisms and reservations that we've had explicitly laid out, chances are very good you have an agenda at work. And I don't see that happening honestly in much of the environmental literature. Everybody wants a clean, healthy climate, a beautiful climate that is not exclusive of any part of the political spectrum. There are legitimate scientific methodological issues here, and we need to do Brisbane dialogues on environmental issues. <laughs> Which, we Which we may well do. John, are you dying to... Well, I mean, I suppose, I suppose <laughs> I'm, I'm hijacking I mean, a lady's I mean, question, and I'll come to you too. channelling people like Thomas Kuhn, who you criticise very strongly in your book. I mean, I think it's, it's certainly, as I mentioned earlier, scientists being careful and never claim something's proven. They don't claim that the theory of evolution is proven. They don't claim uh, that uh, the heliocentric universe is proven. They just say... We've got an awful lot of evidence and it's very strongly in favour of this conclusion and this is the best hypothesis we have. To toss that overboard on the basis of, well, you know, I read this article in, in the newspaper and I thought, uh, I thought it sounded pretty good, just seems to me to, to say, you know, well, you can have whatever truth you like as long as it suits you. You can now tell we're in Australia because we're vigorously debating this issue. <laughs> <laughs> and now I'll come to um, a lady here who's been patiently waiting. 
I can remember first um, realising that postmodernism had come to Australia when um, people stood up and said, that offends me. And I thought, that is totally un-Australian. You can't say, that offends me. You can argue, you can look at a point of view and give another idea, but the whole of the offence thing for words, what you're saying, what your tie looks like, is just un-Australian. Um, it's is a very a widespread phenomenon. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I grew up, I grew up in a long time ago, and people were offended by the sort of body parts, lots of body parts. Um, I think, <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> depends who is. But I, I, you know, the phenomenon of taking offence, I don't think, came to Australia with postmodernism. Yeah, I'm offended is code for I don't have to tolerate, mm. and my my being offended should trump. Sorry, <laughs> should override you know, your right to say what you want. So it's a silencing method. It's a power play. It's un-Australian. It's un-Canadian. It's un-American. It's un-modern civilization. Exactly. I'm going to take one last question uh, from a man over here in a grey jacket. Thank you both very much for what you've contributed. Uh, fragmentation is a, a fragmentation is a, a characteristic of postmodernism, and I'm wondering if there is a bigger educational problem here. And I'm thinking about two parts of the Enlightenment project. One is um, rationality as the flourishing of the mind, and that's been diminishing in our educational programs against another. Edu uh, enlightenment project um, theme, which is an instrumentalist view of education. Well, certainly, I mean, taking instrumentalism, commercialism, and so forth, I think you know, education is under huge threat from that. And I think, in many ways, you know, worrying about what some French people said last century is, is a distraction from the threats the university as a as a haven for inquiry faces. We're having situations where sponsors, foreign governments, companies, all sorts of people are le levering pressure uh, to ensure that views that are inconvenient to them don't get spoken, and we're having pressure all the time to say, if a particular course, like philosophy, doesn't pay its way, well, we'll make way for you know, film studies in place of it. Um, so, yeah, I think, I think that uh, instrumentalism Certainly, is one of the one of the outcomes of, of the Enlightenment, and I think I mean it has its place, but but I think I think it's a, it's a big threat to the university. Uh, I don't see it as a threat to the university. Um, uh, Instrumentalisation is to say that whatever we do in the ivory tower, it should ultimately improve hu the human condition, improve a human life, and uh, uh, we're focused on the individual students in our classrooms at our at our best that whatever you do in your formative years at university, you will put this to use. We are giving you tools to live a good life, however good life you might be defined. Now, that's a very abstract characterization, and partly it's going to depend on why is the student there in particular, is the student there to get a general liberal arts education? Does the student have a very narrow vocational focus? I think there's room for all sorts of universities, research universities, technical universities, liberal arts universities, and so on. Uh, and, and so what I think one of the things that's beautiful about the United States in comparison to Canada where I came from is that it really has an amazing diversity of higher education institutions uh, 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 each drawing the line in different places. So I don't think as a matter of philosophical principle or even educational principle, you can say where that instrumentalism line should be drawn. Each student should draw that for himself or herself. Professors, when they're choosing their professions, will draw the line. And I think colleges and universities will form their own missions about how closely or not they're going to commercialize or, or be distant. Thank you. Fair enough. Just ultimately, it's <laughs> a big word there, I think. That's, yeah. Mm. We've come to the end of the audience questioning section, but I'm going to ask of all of you just one thing. You don't have to speak to this. A traditional Soho Forum debate involves a vote, involves <laughs> a winner and a loser. That's not us. <laughs> the Brisbane Dialogues is far more civilised <laughs> than such a thing. 
but can I ask anyone who came with one idea or on one side um, and goes away either with a more neutral position or having changed sides to raise your hand. Just give us a little indication. Well, that's quite a delightful thing to see. I'll now invite Christine to return. I hope that clapping's not for me because um, I only have one small job at this point. I now call upon the Brisbane Dialogues uh, convener, Murray Hancock, to lead an official vote of thanks for our speakers. Uh, thank you very much, Christine. Um, I feel enormously, um, uh, enormous gratitude to our speakers tonight and uh, very grateful for the opportunity to uh, express that or try to express that on behalf of all of us here and in fact uh, all of those watching remotely and indeed all of those who will be watching this remotely in the future because it, it will be available for watching later. Um, I need to change glasses here but uh, so I, I should just say how the speakers came to, the main speakers came to be up on this stage tonight. I haven't got time for the whole story about Christine and Rachel uh, at this time, but um, by a circuitous route, uh, we uh, came to an understanding with um, uh, the man who's brought or was going to bring Stephen to Australia that you know we'd get him to Brisbane somehow if we could put something on with an opposing speaker. So um, I'd bumped into Daniel Zizzo at a public lecture, and he seemed to like the idea generally. And um, uh, when when I said the speaker Stephen Hicks. Um, he sent an email around the economics school and um, uh, Professor Quiggan came back quite quickly, I'll do it. And, um, and I said, but you, oh, I didn't say it, but I thought, well, you're an economist, what, what would you know about this? And, uh, and, uh, and I said, what sort of topic would you be interested in? You know, Stephen knows quite a lot about postmodernism. And uh, he said, I, I'd like to propose the topic that postmodernism is a right-wing philosophy. And I thought, well, I'd read about one and a half journal, uh, magazine articles about postmodernism at that point. And, uh, but I th thought, of, thought, well, that's a bit counterintuitive. That's interesting. And I emailed Professor Hicks, and he said, a quote, um, that's a very strong, provocative, and important topic. I'll do it. So that's how it happened. And uh, I thought that was terrific. We're off to a flying start here. Then I thought, <clears throat> I wonder how we're going to sell that to the general population of Brisbane, uh, and um, uh, indeed it, um, I don't think it was as easy as some other topics might have been. However, it was, it was exactly the right one uh, to kick it off, I think, because it uh, you know, is interesting and uh, it is counterintuitive and it's many-sided and very nuanced, and um, even if not many minds have been changed tonight, and I'd love to ask the speakers, but maybe we'll do that another later on, you know, if, if their minds changed at all. But uh, you know, obviously a few have, but the most important thing is that um, you know, we all learned something, I think, and some perhaps learned a lot, and we've um, done it without um, uh, too many uh, verbal, <laughs> verbal or a little alone physical fisticuffs. So uh, you know, that, they've made an enormous contribution. Um, I uh, uh, would like to uh, quickly acknowledge Rachel and Christine for doing a fantastic job too and giving up their time in very busy lives and, uh, and really mm -hmm. making this happen. Um, but uh, we haven't got the usual um, tokens of flowers or books or bottles of wine on the stage for various reasons, but I would like to ask the audience to make up for that by uh, showing our appreciation in a very generous traditional manner. Thank you, Murray. Um, a few final uh, notes before we let you go off and brave the rain. Um, we're indebted again to the University of Queensland for its generous support 
in the form of the use of this historic venue. Um, Customs House was acquired and restored by UQ um, through alumni donations, many of whom, many alumni here tonight. Uh, under the university stewardship for the past 25 years, it's been such an important place of engagement, uh, and that's wonderfully manifested tonight. So we thank particularly uh, the team from UQ, Amanda Briggs, Jen Carlson, Michaeli Costello, uh, many other people in that team in the advancement and alumni offices at UQ. Uh, it really couldn't have happened without you um, and your great grace and calm under pressure. Uh, at the very same time, this is awkward, um, we're also keen to collaborate with other universities <laughs> in pursuit of improving dialogue um, and the many areas of life in, uh, in the Brisbane uh, region. Uh, there are so many others in the room um, that we, we can't thank um, individually, but you know who you are, um, and uh, you sh should know that uh, the Brisbane Dialogues logs would simply not have happened, it wouldn't have uh, manifested this way without your enthusiastic support. So now, where to from here? Um, tonight it feels like a, a, just a great moment of, uh, of possibility. It feels like something big could take off. Uh, but by definition, um, a private dialogue requires more than one person, and to be meaningful, a public dialogue requires more than just a handful. The Brisbane Dialogues will therefore depend on the input and support of people such as yourselves. Um, right now, it's a lean, virtual, voluntary organisation, and we intend to keep it that way for as long as possible. The aim is to conserve the philanthropic capital in order to recycle it in support of numerous events and as much constructive ac activity out, um, out there in the communi community as possible. In practice, that means that the Brisbane Dialogues approach will be to support others' events rather than to conduct them ourselves. Apart from you know, one or two other marquee events each year, we'll support others who wish to con contra uh, bring contrasting um, speakers together. We can support with venues, sponsorships, co-promoting, selective um, funding or underwriting ticket sales, but only through the input of um, other volunteers and interested people such as yourselves. Uh, we want to involve as many people as possible and we're keen to receive uh, suggestions about how to do that uh, as we build and how to foster civil discourse. Um, there are numerous ways then that you can help in, a practical, um, in practical ways. Uh, you probably have seen or found this flyer that uh, was on your seat this evening. At least take that home, share it with someone else or share it with a colleague. Indicate your potential interest um, on the forms available. Read the website and give your feedback there. Um, like our Facebook page and, and comment and get in touch that way. Of course, you can finally also show your support for our speakers by buying their books. Um, just to remind you, they'll be on sale again after we've finished here. Those holding premium tickets are welcome to get their book signs and meet Stephen and John in person um, over here in this corner. So finally, thanks for your support and your involvement. Please keep talking and have a safe trip home. Thank you. Thank you.